If you are thinking about buying a new Subaru Forester, you might want to wait a year. The fourth generation Subaru Forester, introduced in 2013 as a 2014 model, is showing its age and it's ready for a complete remodel. True to Subaru's life cycle of five years, the Japanese automaker is working on the new fifth generation 2019 Forester SUV now and it's due out next year. It's coming with plenty of changes for SUV buyers and it's worth waiting for. What can consumers expect when it arrives? The new global platform that underpins the Impreza Compact and new 2018 Crosstrek is Subaru's biggest advancement in their automobiles since they developed the Driver Assist EyeSight Safety System. It's coming on the new generation 2019 Subaru Forester. Here's what consumers can expect. Consumers will see noticeable changes in the new generation Forester's driving dynamics because it will ride on the new Subaru Global Platform. In a nutshell, the new underpinnings will reduce vibrations and produce a smoother ride quality. The body and chassis will be 70 to 100% more rigid which will translate to improved steering response, and the increased rigidity of the suspension mounting will reduce body roll by 50% compared to current models like we see in the new Impreza and 2018 Crosstrek. SUVs sit up high and don't perform well when taking curves at higher speeds or when changing directions quickly. The 2019 Forester will be designed with a lower center of gravity improving driving dynamics in the corners producing a more dynamic ride. Forester will also grow slightly in size, have a roomier cabin, and enjoy better fuel economy with a direct injection engine. It will also come with several new EyeSight Drivers Assist upgrades. Subaru's new generation all-wheel drive 2019 Forester will be the safest SUV they've ever built. The new architecture underpinning the fifth generation Forester will improve crash energy absorption by 40% over present models keeping occupants safer in the event of a crash. Impreza and Crosstrek which already have it can survive an impact by a heavier SUV weighing 2.5 tons at 66 mph. After an impact, the two vehicles A and B pillars will retain their integrity protecting the occupants. A camouflaged fifth generation Forester was spied recently and it could get styling cues borrowed from Subaru's upcoming three-row ascent SUV, as well as a character line similar to the new Crosstrek. Forester is the next vehicle in Subaru's lineup to get a complete makeover with the new global platform, and it will also get a complete drive-a-train remodel. If you are thinking about buying a new Subaru Forester, you might want to wait a year. Look for the all-new 2019 Subaru Forester to arrive late next year. Stay tuned. Subaru's Australian importer had a brilliant month in July, growing at a rate unmatched by any other top 20 car maker and achieving almost 5% market share. VFACTS figures show that the Japanese company's sales last month were 27.1% greater than July in 2016, at 4265 units. This figure put it in 8th position for the month, one unit behind Kia up 20% in its own right, and ahead of a declining Nissan, plus Volkswagen and Honda. The growth rate was the highest of any top 20 player, though a few smaller volume brands grew higher on a proportional basis in July, such as 21st placed Skoda, 508, up 38%, and 23rd placed Mini, 379, up 29%. Subaru's annual sales are also up a shade over 10% in an overall market up 0.4%, the best growth of the big volume players alongside Honda and Kia. July's results saw the just-launched new Subaru XV lead the way for the company with 1138 sales in its first full month on the market, up 88.1%. The STEM new Impreza yielded 914 sales, up 195.8% for the month and 122.1% YTD, while the Outback maintained success with 907 sales, up 3.4%. 
BRZ sales are also up 73.1% YTD. Subaru Australia's Managing Director Colin Christie said, Customer response to our new generation cars is just phenomenal and with revised WRX, WRX STI and Levork lineups just revealed, we're very excited about maintaining the momentum. On a regional basis, Subaru sales in South Australia were up 59.1% for the month, while growth in Tasmania was 114%, with disproportionate 10% market share thanks to its AWD credentials. The Western Australia region returned sales growth of 41.5% in July, Victoria sales were up 37.3%, NSW sales were up 14.1% and Queensland sales climbed 13.7%. It's not all great news, though. Sales of the aging Forester, down 3.7% YTD in a booming segment, and Liberty, down 35% are dragging the chain a little. Since the announcement of the 2040 ban on new petrol and diesel cars, all you read in the news is about how we're all going electric. So if that's the case, which is the best electric car to buy? We chose three to test, a Renault Zoe, Hyundai Ioniq and Nissan Leaf. The Hyundai Ioniq is by far the newest and in our opinion one of the best equipped. The Nissan and the Renault have both been around for some years now, and the Leaf is actually due to be replaced by a new model next year. The Ioniq is Hyundai's first attempt at making an all-electric car, and it's very good. Inside, the cabin feels solidly built and very comfortable. It also has lots of kit including, on our car, heated and cooled electric seats. Next is the Renault Zoe. A great looking little car with bags of character on the exterior alone. Step inside and it's also a funky place to be. It also features the best claimed range of the three EVs, with 250 miles on the NEDC cycle thanks to its new ZE. 40 feet battery. Finally, we have the Nissan Leaf, the oldest of the three in terms of design and this shows in its rather ungainly styling and outdated technology. It also has the lowest theoretical range with just 155 miles. This is where the Nissan Leaf falls down, massively. It is not appealing at all on the outside with its bulbous rear end and huge headlights. This continues inside where it can best be described as dull and old-fashioned. The Hyundai is in a different league. It looks fresh, funky and modern. Add a touch of color and you have a car that will be very enjoyable to own. This continues inside too where it feels light and airy with a very easy to use dashboard and center console. The Renault is the best looking of the bunch. Its chic Parisian styling blends well with modern life and makes it look more premium than it actually is. However, this doesn't quite continue inside. Although the cabin looks chic, it feels cheap, with the plastics belonging in a cheap Super Mini. In terms of space, all three are roughly the same, offering ample leg, head and luggage space and a plethora of cubby holes throughout the cabin. The Hyundai feels a tad better than the other two, and has a fairly decent sized boot at 350 liters, enough for some suitcases or a weekly shop. You can probably fit the family dog in there too. The Zoe feels slightly smaller in comparison, but is more of a hatchback compared to the Ionic saloon looks. It has a marginally smaller boot at 338 liters but this would definitely be enough on a daily basis. The Nissan LEAF boasts the largest boot at 370 liters. It also has a fairly large cabin, which can easily accommodate for adults. The Hyundai Ioniq feels the best by far to drive. This is largely down to how composed it feels on almost any road surface, largely due to the fact that it's the most composed. It also has a touch more power than the other two, managing 0-60 mph in 9.7 seconds, while the Nissan and Renault manage 60 mph in 11.3 and 13.3 seconds respectively. 
The Ionic might be the most refined of the three, but really they're more for inner city driving rather than motorway cruising, especially the case with the Nissan which seems to take an age to actually get up to any speed. In terms of value for money, the Renault is the most affordable, with our Zoe Dial Meek Navar 90 ZE40 test car costing £19,295, with a government grant. On board you find a surprising amount of equipment including satellite navigation, Bluetooth connectivity, rear parking sensors and 16-inch alloys. The Hyundai Ioniq Premium SE we drove cost £26,860. This might be a considerable amount more but in our view it's well worth it. Not only does it feel the best to drive it also comes with full leather upholstery, heated front seats, satellite navigation and a rear parking camera to name but a few. The Nissan LEAF was the most expensive of the three, and is the least value for money. The Tecna model we drove cost a staggering £27,790 with none of the car reflecting such a price tag. The standard equipment may consist of leather upholstery, heated front and rear seats, satellite navigation and Bluetooth connectivity, but it's hard to justify when it all feels so old-fashioned. From the three we have tested our pick would be the Renault Zoe overall in terms of value for money. But for everything else the Hyundai Ioniq wins hands down. It's refined, comfortable, easy to drive, easy to park and above all excellent value for money. At the other end of the spectrum is the Nissan LEAF, which we'd struggle to recommend. However, a new LEAF is on its way which looks to be a much more impressive car.